Welcome to the art and science of difficult conversations. I'm Chris. And I'm Lucy, and we love having difficult conversations. That's right. And each week, we'll either share a tip, hear how others have gotten better at difficult conversations, or demonstrate common difficult conversations and what to do and what not to do. Let's get into it. Welcome to today's episode. Today, I'm interviewing Jack Skeels. He's a former researcher at the Rand Corporation, and he's the CEO of Agency Agile. And also, he's just an author. He just published a book called Unmanaged, and I'm excited to talk to him about his journey and really just learn about how he got comfortable with leadership and difficult conversation in his role. So let's jump into it. So welcome to today. I'm excited to have Jack. I got to meet him recently, and I'm excited to chat with him. Jack, thanks for coming on to our podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on here, Chris. Been looking forward to it all week. Yeah, I'm excited because I just love talking to authors just because I think it's cool to, that you are able to put all your thoughts so organized. Um, but why don't you share a little bit of how, your journey of how you got here? Sure, yeah. yeah. If so I have a very strange journey. I'm sure we're going to talk about it a little bit more as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the I, I've been sort of a pinball uh, bouncing through life through a lot of things and uh, started out as a software developer. They called them programmers back then and got into project management, even though I hated project managers. And mm -hmm. that led to 20 years of, of a pretty cool career and then went through a research institution, Rand. I was a researcher there and then back into the real world. And uh, another 20 years have passed and a lot of learnings. And uh, most recently I've been working with, worked with over 200 agencies marketers and other complex organizations and showing them how to how to do what they do better actually hmm. what inspired you to to move into the move into the field of helping other people perform better you know i think there are a couple things one was the a very personal thing which is that i i think i i grew up with a really tough i know i grew up with a really tough childhood now that i think i did I grew up with a really tough childhood and and my folks just did not get along. It was a sort of miserable home life, if you will, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And I I grew up with this idea that wouldn't it be nice if everyone could just get along better? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so in in that way, I think that's the thing that actually propelled me out of being a single contributor, like a programmer or something like that, into the yeah, you know, I used to lead consortia of different countries and companies at the international standards level, uh, a lot of different situations, and they all have that thread in common, which is somehow just I really like helping people do what they're doing better. And um, it, it, it ties to a key belief on my part, which is, and I sort of learned this later, but it ties it all together, I think, that what happens in the workplace is is in part an instigator of what happens at home, right? And the even though we can't even dichotomize those two things all that well anymore, right? Yeah. But if I if I have a good day, if I'm loving my work and feeling a passion for what I'm doing and the people I work with and feeling like I'm accomplishing things, I'm a better person for the rest of the day and the rest of yeah. the week and month. And and so I think there's a there's a greater good that happens when we when we make workplaces greater, you know, that way. Yeah. And that's powerful, I think, to be able to tap into that that higher purpose and be able to live that out. That's really cool. Yeah, it was something that, to be honest, it came it came the other way around. Like I was just, you know, look, we all we all have our struggles to survive, and what am I going to do? And I've always been very independent, like consultant and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And and one day I realized that I was actually creating a lot of good, and then I I liked that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's kind of nice. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and the more I thought about it, I thought, wow, that's you know, hey, finally I found it. This is the way I can create good in the world. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was. But it was weird. It wasn't. I know there are a lot of people who say, you know, I I want to go create good, and I know how I want to create good. Um, I was not one of those. Mm -hmm. I was the one who said, holy shit, look what happened. Um, hey, that's cool. <laughs> so yes. I can get behind that. Yeah, that's awesome. So you mentioned your your upbringing. You know, you, because this podcast is really about difficult conversations. Kind of, what were you taught about leadership and difficult conversations from a young age? 
<laughs> yeah, that that was an interesting lesson. I was I was basically taught to avoid the tough the tough conversations. My parents were uh, had a very avoidant model and the like, and so mm -hmm. I, I it was only through great work that I learned uh, you know great work as in therapy and working on myself and thinking about all those sorts of things and and reflecting on what my life journey was um, that I actually became better at actually leaning into that stuff. I think it's really easy to, I think one of the, if I had to convey a key learning in my life, it is listen to what's being said to you. Okay. Mm. And it, it matters more than what you say about yourself and, and not that you need to take it literally, but yeah. in a way, life, life hands us lessons, right? And you don't know what the lesson's going to be, but um, I would rather be in school learning than pretending I know everything. Right. And so I think that's the that's that, that was a shift for me. But I, I was very avoidant when I was young and um, just like just like they had been. So. When did you was it early on in your career that you noticed like there was a, a tension between avoiding these conversations and the impact you wanted to have? You know, it was I I think the, the key moment, which is one of the ones that you know we, we probably want to talk about today, really was when I I got into kind of one of the pinnacles of my career running uh sapient's los angeles office sapient is a global consultancy now they've merged with a um advertising marketing agency called publicist but they're i think it's probably a twenty thousand person global organization wow. now and the like but i ran the la office which was about 105 people and it was quite a crowning achievement because i'd never really actually try wanted to even try that right so i, I yeah. was anointed that and it was, it was a great job and the like so it was in that sort of peak moment there that i i think that i really saw the value of of of, of listening to what's being told to you but i'm going to tell you a quick little one before that which was yeah, please because of all that tough childhood i was in uh undergrad you know getting my i think it was like in medieval studies or something like that and uh, and I was in a fraternity also, which was the main focus of my life, and mm -hmm. eventually got got washed out of school in my sophomore mm -hmm. year. Wow. And it, you know, I'm talking to my dad was a professor at the university. And we have the same name, so you know, here I'm sitting in front of the dean of liberal arts and sciences, who's a good family friend, and he's telling me, "You're out of here, brother. You know, figure out what wow. you want to do with your life." And he said something really great at that moment, which was um, the, you know, do do the best, just choose, just pick something and do the best at it, right? Mm -hmm. And I sort of laughed, scoffed at him. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going out to work at a Del Monte factory and tried to become a plumber. And I thought, okay, I'm <laughs> going to be the best plumber I can be. And the there was a five five month probationary period and at the end of the five month probationary period look I, i'm i'm smart dude okay and plumbing is not doesn't necessarily require a lot of smarts yeah. at the end of five months they they let me go oh and wow I was heartbroken and but it was one of the most fantastic things that ever happened to me my my supervisor a guy named chuck henby chuck said jack you don't belong here you don't belong as a plumber you belong mm. in college. It's where you need to go. I don't know what you need to do to get back there, but you need to get back there. It changed my life. That one moment is wow. a beautiful, beautiful moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's like one of those moments you script out in movies. Just that person that sees <laughs> your potential and that just helps you get back into that space. You know, I'll tell you, I was heartbroken. It, I mean, sure. I, as, as wise as his words were, it felt impossible to me. Like I'd been... Mm washed out of school i didn't even know how to get back into college or anything like that but it was great it was great advice and uh yeah 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 i'm sure in the moment it didn't feel great <laughs> no, <it didn't. laughs> yeah so then and i know that you know we talked about this a little bit before just to kind of prep um you know you talked about th that's one of the inspirations for the even you writing a book right about mm -hmm. leadership right yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in. I was um, running that uh, sapient office, and I think I had gotten recently been rated like they they rate all the office leaders and people at that level on a global scale. Like it was like fifty of us across the world, 
Yeah, that was like number seven. I was on the first page of the list when the PowerPoint, right? You know, I was like, woohoo, that's fantastic. And then, you know, three months later, I was getting laid off. It was the global economic downturn, but you think they would, you know, I thought I would have gotten some credit for that number seven ranking. Sure. And when I, when the conversation happened, it's never a fun conversation, right? Um, it was mm -hmm. a surprise. My, my, my immediate boss, um, uh, said to me and i don't know where this came from but he, he said well and you were never that good of a manager anyway Ooh, it's like whoa I, you know and i i was so numb from the just the idea i walked into the office that morning thinking hey another day we're gonna just keep it upbeat because we've laid off a bunch of people and you know all of a sudden i'm in a room with my boss and his boss and i'm thinking oh this is not good and and then I get that little stinger at the end, and I just walked out numb, you know, had my box of stuff for my desk and all that. And later I got pissed. I got really upset. I'm like, what the hell, man? Didn't you see that number seven ranking? And you know, yeah. I hit all my numbers and and I I'd been at Rand Corporation, the think tank. I'd been a researcher, and I thought, I'm gonna go research what it is to really be a great manager. I'm gonna write a book about that. And in yeah. literally, I, I had this nice severance. I did have a very nice severance pack, package, partly because I actually gave them a hard time about what what my manager had said to me, uh -huh. and they were they were gracious about it. And I said, okay, well, hey, you know, take a couple extra months or something like that. And I spent probably six months researching the book and really mapping it out. And it was great. It was just a really nice time. Uh, I would have rather had a paycheck, but you know, it, it, it was a really nice time doing that. And I got to this very, very strange conclusion. The strange conclusion, it, it was in a way a difficult conversation with myself, right? Um, yeah. Was I'd actually mapped it out. I figured it out. It, it, all this great research on how, how people manage. And, and in fact, when you look at how people manage out there, they most people don't know this so you, you manage by instinct or whatever the other people do like i i used to do as well and i thought wow this is amazing information and it's a it's a new way of managing and all that kind of thing and by the way i was a horrible manager too and and he was right okay he he was absolutely right and i i was doing what everyone else was doing i'm not sure why he thought i was worse at it than everyone else okay <laughs> But, but I, I was, I was guilty. And I, at that moment I said, I'm not going to be one of those people who writes a book about something that they've never done. Hmm. And so that was the, yeah, that sent me on a, essentially a, what's now been a 15, 16 year journey of going out and proving it. Right. Hmm. And, um, and then just in the last couple of years, I, I, I said, okay, good enough. Probably would have been good enough, you know, like 10 years ago, but I'd, just in the last couple of years, yeah. I said, fine, let's, let's do it. Let's dig that stuff up and, and write, write down what I've learned. Cause I actually learned a lot more than what I had done the research on, right. It's actually yeah. how to apply this stuff and everything. Right. I, I appreciate that you felt the need to learn how to apply it. Also, was there any, were there any behaviors or habits that you were, that were especially challenging for you to, to try to implement? Well, yeah, the the main one is exactly what you said, which is I'm great at the at the first two thirds of a project, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that the one needs to be very aware of their of their sort of the range of behaviors that you're very capable of and those that you are not very capable of or, or don't like to do. Usually that's sort of the same thing. We we don't get the things that we don't do well, we don't get a lot of positive reinforcement on. Um, or we just hate them, right? Mm. And one of the things for me is the last that last third or the last twenty five percent of any given project, um, yeah. I'm like, oh, come on, aren't, aren't we mm. done with this yet? You know, mm -hmm. can you guys just finish it? Um, I'm a rock star in the first twenty five percent. Like, what is it we're doing? How should we be doing it? What didn't we think of? And I mean, even at at times, I would say I've been told I'm brilliant at that and the like. And I think that that was the, the one of the things that really gave me a good appreciation about how hard it is to be a good manager, mm. is that it's it's not just enough to know what to do, which is a huge hill to climb, mm. but then to go apply it 
every single day relentlessly and and stay focused on it and even though it's obvious or easy to understand doing it is a matter of it's a, a level of personal mastery that i i would claim that i probably never accomplished and when i say i, I proved it i didn't prove that if i do it it works okay mm -hmm. what yeah. i what i proved is we could that we could teach other managers how to do it right yeah and that if they did that, then that was better managing and the like. I I confess, I may not be, I'm certainly better than I used to be. Let's let's just leave it at that. So sure, I sure. have I've raised my bar a little bit, man. You know what I respect about your story also is, and I've talked about this a lot recently, is like it's hard to hear that feedback, mm -hmm. but then also to even change your mind because we're always going to think that we're right initially. Um, what was that process like for you to do all this research and then slowly realize, oh, I'm wrong, so I need to change the way I'm viewing the whole situation? Yeah, yeah, you know the um, I, I think that's one of the one of the things I thought about us talking about as well is the I, I think the world the world gives you you can think of the world as a a teacher, right? Life. Life and the world is a, a massive school that you're enrolled in or something like that. And the question is, do you really want to go to class every day? And I, one can be forgiven for taking a few days off class. And I, I totally get that and the like. Yet the, the risk is that if we if we ignore and duck away from what we're being told, uh, we lose the chance to learn. Hmm. And And one of the, when I was at Rand Corporation, the think tank, there was a great lesson that I learned one time, and I do talk about this in the book as well, as well as my story. But it, it, I call it the Afghanistan man story because we, um, they were interviewing. I was, I was the, like the pet monkey inside this fifteen hundred person research organization. Mm -hmm. I'm just a smart MBA kid, mm -hmm. and they're all PhDs, and some of them had like double PhDs and all that kind wow. of stuff. Yeah. But they would invite me around to meetings just for the fun of it. And I sat in this one where they interviewed this guy um, who was an Afghanistan scholar. He knew all about the history of Afghanistan, politics, all that kind of thing. And there, there was this conversation for 45 minutes. And I was very fortunate that one of our family friends um, was from Afghanistan. So I knew at least knew where the country was and recognized a few words and that kind of thing. And at the end of the meeting, um, and it was sort of a quasi interview, right? At the end of the meeting, the, the visitor left. And they're all sitting around and this top top researcher guy named Dick knew he's a great guy. Dick said to me, he goes, well, what do you think, Jack? Should we hire him? I, I came in to say it with a straight face. It was such a funny thing. And everyone chuckled like he was at, like Dick was asking me, like, should I hire yeah. this guy? And I, I, um, I knew I was being set up and I, I didn't know what, what the setup was. And I said, well, he seems like he knows a lot. And, and Dick said, exactly. You're right. And that's why we're not hiring him. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really interesting comment. And and everyone just starts smiling and they know that I don't get it. Okay. Because I'm doing just like you are right here. It's like, well, mm, doesn't make sense. Right, right, Dick, right. Said, Dick says, we only hire people who are asking questions still. Anyone who thinks they know all the answers, we have no need for them. They're not learning anymore. Okay. Hmm. Our job is not to have answers, but is to ask great questions. And having answers, and here it is, having answers is the end of all learning. Hmm. That's that's sort of, I mean, you might as well yeah. stop, right? And and so it, that was something I took with me. And that was like in 2000 when that, when that conversation happened. And I thought, well, I was probably an annoying little kid because I am a question person, right? But sure. also that, you know, asking questions is a massive skill if you want to make yourself better. And and some of the questions you should ask are questions of yourself, right? Back to your yeah. original point, which is, I know I feel like I'm right, but am I really right? Mm -hmm. Or in what ways could I be wrong? And that kind of thing. So, um, and that that creates that, that thing that they call humility is really the willingness to ask yourself a, about whether you you're right you know yeah i love that and so so then what what do you think are like your top one to two takeaways for someone who's trying to get better at receiving feedback uh, asking questions being curious i i think that the one is try to understand it well first of all just don't ignore it just use it like look i you know i went from thinking 
my boss, what an asshole. I can't believe you said that to me. I'm so hurt and all that kind of thing to, you know, fast forward to today. And I'm like, well, that's right up there with Chuck Handy's comment to me about going back to college, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it propelled me in a direction I never could have imagined. And, and look at the beauty in my life and others that I've created as a result. So one is don't ignore it. I mean, that's probably the most important thing is that the, uh, and don't, don't ignore what, what happens for you inside of that, right? And I think that the, my internal journey has always been a, it's been a very, very cool part of that kind of thing. In other words, the looking at, uh, at what, what possible way could this be true, right? Mm -hmm. And, and why is it, why does this piss me off so much? Okay. Because by the way, mm -hmm. you're responsible, you're responsible for your own emotions. Okay. Is yeah. no one can actually hurt you emotionally. It's your decision to be hurt about something. Right. And so the, 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 you can be righteous about this hurt that someone has inflicted, but the reality is the only person inflicting that hurt is you on yourself. And so I think that's the question is why am I, why does this hurt so much? What is it? And I'll tell you a lot of times it, it exposes a truth inside of you. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, I was even hurt when someone told me that thing about me not being great on the last 25% of a project. Okay. It was one of my old bosses yeah. and and he's a loving guy and he meant it very nicely, which is he loved having me kick projects off, but he hated having me end them. And I could take it as him being an asshole or I could take it as being, well, maybe he just taught me something about myself. Yeah. So I think the ability to ask yourself the questions probably more important. Um, I, I think there's probably some skill in asking them, well, what, what do you mean by that? Okay. What, what makes you think that, that kind of thing. But I, I, I don't want to, again, like the book, I'm not particularly good at that, but, uh, <laughs> but I, in theory, it exists as a practice too. Right. It's a learning journey, right? It's, yeah. it takes time to be able to respond and not react in the yeah, moment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the other things I go into in the book, um, because the part of great managers is not being part of, part of being a great manager is not being reactive mm. in, in a way you need to be the you know, the patient parent, the humble gardener, the the mm. thoughtful responder and the like. And there's a whole cycle we have called the essentially a reactive cycle and that you, you can stop that. And the, your ability to stop and listen and take a breath, um, it's called the stop model, as stop, take a breath, observe and proceed. Mm. Um, it, it. It's a, it's a really great way to just sort of desensitize your reaction to a given situation and it's ridiculously hard to do but you can do it in situations where maybe it isn't deeply involved with you right like in a work setting and i think that's again back to that question you see a situation and you go what is my best response okay not not just respond but what is my first response should be what is my best response right yeah and and usually the answer to that is a, a question and you see a crisis at work and you think, you know, you want to go, who caused this? That's not a question, right? Okay. That's a statement. <laughs> Someone caused it, right? Right. The real question is, Hey, Hey, what else do we need to know about this situation? Mm. Right. And, okay. or, um, uh, what, what needs to be done? Right. These are all questions that actually create a conversation where people start getting engaged and involved and you can learn more. Um, and and so use, using questions in that way can be very powerful as well to even get yourself out of, mm. you know, old blame models and stuff like that. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you're speaking my language as a licensed oh, therapist. Cool. That's <laughs> are you? Oh, I didn't know you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a licensed therapist, and you know, it could take months or years to get people to just get out of that reactionary phase of instinct and yeah. learn to stop. I love that acronym. I've never heard it before. I'll definitely use it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so you mentioned your book a few times. I'd love to learn more about it. I'm sure the listeners would love to learn more about the book itself and kind of what else they can expect to read and get out of it. Well, the book is called Unmanaged. If you if you have a video version of this podcast, you'll see me holding it here. Yep. Uh, the idea behind the book is is just sort of what, what we're talking about is that unmanaged, like if I said to you, my team is unmanaged, you might react and say, Oh my God, someone needs to manage them, right? 
And my answer would be, well, actually, my team is running a lot better than your managed team. And the, the really to point out this idea that, you know, the, the choice of what to do, that reactive choice is, is very, very important and nowhere more important than in managing today because we overmanage teams, we overmanage people, our organizations are little, littered with managers and layers of managers and different types of managers and the like. And so I, in the book, I tear this all apart and I deconstruct it, explain where it came from, and then some tips for how to not only fix some of that in the organizational context, but actually towards the end, how to fix that in the personal context. Mm. And so I think it's a, it's a really, it's a little bit of a brain dump from that perspective. It reads very well. It's gotten some very nice ratings and independent review, view, reviews and that kind of thing. But it's a book. It's sort of the the Bible of Jack's head for the last 20 years or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's a very enjoyable book. And uh, uh, it, I think it will make it'll make you a more aware manager and probably a better person also. Yeah. And I, I don't know about you, but I always appreciate like there's two types of leadership books, leadership books that are grounded in like philosophy and theory and one that are based on people's experiences and best practices. And I always find a lot more value out of the ones based in theory and practice. And like, I've actually tried to do this. This is what it looks like. This is what it, how it can't work and the nuance of that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, I, I totally believe that I actually have a third category, which I call business porn. Okay. Mm. And that's like the, you know, good to great or one of the Jack oh, yeah, yeah, books yeah. or something like that, where they attribute a lot of things um, to certain behaviors, which may or may not, the situation is always way more complex than what they describe. And in a sense, the, the book is, I call it porn just because it, you're reading about a situation that you will never be in. Okay. You're never going to be the CEO of this fortune 100 company mm -hmm. making this critical decision and this, or if you are, you're not reading this book, right? <laughs> the, yeah, and, and so it's this, oh, wouldn't it be nice if sort of reading, but it has no, like you say, no applicability at all, right? Right. And and I, I think there are, you identified there are these very theoretical books. I I I like those because I'm a former researcher, but also I realize that you've got to you've got to have some reality to it. And so we've got uh, many, many of the sections start with little anecdotes and vignettes on different clients we've worked with and that kind of thing. And we put exercises in there for that same reason that you brought up, which is Great. what can I do, right? Or how do I do this? How do I create this kind of conversation? That kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I, I think there, you know, the book suffers from trying to have a lot of stuff in it, but uh, I, I think there's sort of something for everyone in there too. So I love that. So then for the listeners, where can they follow you? Where can they connect with you in life? Yeah, you know, I think LinkedIn is the best way to do these things for me. It's uh, it, all this, all the social media have gotten so busy with, you know, it's just they're noisy in a way. And uh, so I, I stick to LinkedIn. Uh, please connect with me or follow me. I'm usually posting an article or we've got webinars on these topics every every week or two and um, just do it that way. If there's some way we can help, my company is Agency Agile. We actually do all kinds of consulting on how organizations can work better and the like. Um, so certainly you can reach out to us that way at agencyagile.com. But I mean, just contact, connect with me. I'd love to hear from you. Great. And your company, do they work with any specific type of industry or size of company or level of the company? Well, we, we typically do holistic organizational transformation, usually right. small to medium-sized businesses, you know, from five to 500 people in terms of organizational size. And uh, we have focused on some very difficult industries because there's nothing as fun as solving a difficult problem, <laughs> which would be advertising and marketing and software development organizations, mm -hmm. consulting organizations, stuff like that. Very cool. And your book, people can get it on Amazon, I imagine, and everywhere else, right? It, it is everywhere else, but I can tell you, looking at the reports, nobody buys books anywhere else than Amazon <laughs> these days. <laughs> I don't, so sad. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we've got, you know, work on Barnes and Noble, Ingram, and all these other ones, and nobody. So, yeah, yeah. crickets. Uh, good luck to them. I hope they can survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all. Awesome. So, Jack, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate this conversation. I love learning about your your story. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me, Chris. Very, very enjoyable conversation. Great questions. And 
um, it, really a delight to be able to, um, that sounds, sounds a little strange to talk about myself the whole time, but <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, I, I like the format of this podcast as well. I'm sure, I hope your listeners enjoy our episode as well. Thanks so much. A very big thank you to my guest, Jack Skeels. I'm going to link all of his socials, his company, his book in the show notes, so you'll be able to get it. Tune in next week when I'm going to talk through what are things not to say in hard conversations. So we're going to go through some essential communication skills. I'll see you next week. Make sure you subscribe to this and leave us a review if you have a chance. Thanks. See you next week.